Hello, everyone. Welcome to the LTG Show. My name is Sean Wilburn, and today I am joined with my fellow lazy tech guys in the house. I have Rad for Castro. Hey. I got Andrew Lee. Welcome back. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Yeah, I'm so happy that food poisoning was great, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, the, of course, Tony Hannity's. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you guys doing? All right. Doing well, man. All right. So, r- first and foremost, I'm going to go ahead and give you some contact information for, ro- for us. Um, the easiest way of reaching us, email, comments at lazytechguys.com, or you can give us a call at area code 707-722-722. 5299. Now, this show that you're listening to is also brought to you by a couple sponsors. The first one happens to be Dine.com, a perfect place to get reliable uh, DNS uh, service. And the other sponsor is Audible.com, a place where you can get great, high quality audiobooks that you can listen to that work on just about any device. So, and now, <clears throat> LTG show, everybody stretched out. Are you guys all ready to go? You know, oh, yeah. Pumps and everything. <laughs> Ready? Ah. All right. So, um, all right. First things first. It actually does suck a little bit that Victor's not on the show because his first topic is definitely all him. But um, <laughs> I just really wanted to point this out to all y'all out there listening. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, there's an awesome post on our website called Death Star Raid an Inside Job. Now, of course, we're nerds and we have to laugh and we have to enjoy ourselves. So what this is, is someone else decided to take the time and really, really look at the entire scenario between star Wars and what happened and how the, the terrorist group called the rebel Alliance, which is very humorous that they call it a terrorist group. Um, (laughs) and how it could be that the entire blowing up of the death star was actually an inside job. It was perpetrated by Darth Vader with his family uh, Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker. And to add fuel to it, think about it. Luke Skywalker was the only person who really survived the entire attack. He was protected by Vader when Vader said, No, I got this one. And then he missed the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you say, mm-hmm. huh? What do you guys think? Anyway, it's quite an awesome post. And just because I am who I am and we can't play a little audio now because we have that capabilities, let me play a little segment just so you can get kind of listen to this here. Right, the attack. <laughs> Let's look at the events leading up to the detonation. <laughs> the Death Star's defenses easily staved off most of the Rebel Alliance terrorists until the only remaining fighter was Luke's X-Wing. Ooh. Mm-hmm. As he approached the ventilation duct along the trench, his father Anakin was now leading the three TIE Fighters in direct pursuit. <laughs> Log show pilots in the TIE Fighter squads were prepared to fire on Luke's X-Wing when they were ordered the same to guy who down. figured out Ice Cube could one. day. <laughs> it might be. Was he simply protecting his own son, or was he setting the stage for a larger plan? I just like it toward the end of it, but just so you know, toward the end of it, Princess Leia is involved, and it has to do with a construction uh, bid to get the uh, building of the next Death Star. <laughs> Anakin's, uh, Anakin's construction company. Yeah, which is, <laughs> which is great when he says, Dark in his end, it's builders. like the Halliburton of Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. And multiple witnesses think- Here's, a, like, here's another part that's pretty incriminating, pretty interesting here. L- listen to this part right here. Father's Imperial Destroyer. Record show she was taken to the Death Star, and multiple witnesses state she was seen in the Death Star control room when the planet she was princess of, Aldebaran, was destroyed and all its inhabitants killed. W- why was she there? Her- why was she yeah, there, like, everybody? She gave the order, right. Yeah, she could have really given the order, like. <laughs> but the, according to the logs and what they're saying, it could be an inside job. Anyway, very interesting, very fun post. If you haven't had a chance to come to our website, the post is called Death Star Raid, an Inside Job. Just come there, have some fun, check it out. LazyTechGuys.com, that's the website you go to. All right. Now, this next topic here was actually something I saw literally, uh, I guess it went up earlier today posted by the Washington Post, and it reads, the Washington Post to charge frequent users of its website. (sighs) All right, so this is what they're doing. If you actually are a big reader of the Washington Post, if you tend to go to that website, let's say more than 20 times a month or so, then you're going to be asked to pay a fee. And of course, they haven't figured out how much the fee is going to be yet. (laughs) 
Um. All right. <laughs> you lost the words. <laughs> First here, uh, Tony Red, Andrew. Who you guys are all just like scratching your heads a little bit, but is this so, a good sorry. idea? <laughs> what well, happens when you get over visit number like one thousand one or five thousand one? How does that work? Well, you, apparently you might get a little <laughs> fee taking saying, "Oh, you've been to our site. You must now pay three dollars to get, to visit our site now." Wow. Can I so, clear my can I clear my cookies and then start all over again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they got over that now. <laughs> so, but okay, so here's here's a quote from um the post here. News customers are savvy. They understand the high cost of top quality news gathering operation and the importance of maintaining the kind of in-depth reporting for which the post is known for. Our digital package is a valuable one and we are going to ask our readers to pay for it and help support our news gathering as they have done for many years with the print edition. I mean, isn't that what Wall Street Journal Online does? Like, if I go to it right now, I can only see a certain certain part of the post, and if I want to see more of it, um, I have to pay uh, the monthly subscription. I mean, I mean, isn't that what they do, or am I off base on that? No, no, you're, you're, you are right. That's exactly what they do, but is it a... I mean, but does that turn you off on the Wall Street Journal? Because I, I know never since I've been seeing that more and more, every, the minute I see, you must pay back. I think <laughs> if the Wall Street Journal was more of a prevalent uh, periodical to you, then right. it would, it would yeah. matter. But to me, it's only, uh, it's only an important uh, piece of um, news reading um, during certain times of the year or during certain events that happen. And uh, or or sometimes when we talk about it here on this show. Otherwise, I never go to that website. Um, I'm just being blatantly honest. Um, when when it comes to the the post, kind of the same thing. I mean, uh, they they are definitely a very um, reputable news source, but I I wouldn't go there to um, to get my first hand exclusive, if you will. Is Washington Post more conservative? Or is that more? Is it more lefty? Like you know how Huff, HuffPo is more I lefty. Think Huff, Huff I think is more lefty. On, yeah, I think it depends on who you, what who you radio station to? you're listening to. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? Um, uh, who who owns it? For example, yeah. uh, for a question. Who owns the <laughs> Washington Post? <laughs> and Google comes back. We do. <laughs> like, oh, never mind. Okay, then. Washington Post here is a, a mass American company owned by. Uh, own, they also own Kaplan. Hmm. I guess they are the yeah the Washington Post company. Well, there you go. That's the best yeah, name they, in the world. <laughs> Especially if you're the, the Washington Post. After that. If you were anybody but the Washington Post, you'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. So we know that the um, Washington Journal gets away with this, and I and it's funny how they say that to get your premier. Information. I guess there is a point where if the quality is that good, because I find the Wall Street Journal post through other blogs. Like I'll sit there and find an all an all all things D article, and it will sit there and link to the Wall Street Journal, and I'm like, okay, click here to see the rest of the thing. So I click on it, and it says, oh, you must read this, and I'm like, well, I don't want to eat the information that bad. I'll just take their word for it. But I'm I'm sure there is probably a segment of people that will really I don't know maybe pay for it to see their words or their I don't know. I mean that's the thing. I mean we, we live in a the society where right now uh, a lot of the news pieces we can get are free, but then at the same time it becomes hearsay. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, as you said, if it, it, if you're getting it from All Things D, most likely it's a valid valid art, um, article, and whatever they're trying to drill home is as close to the original source of the article. Um, but if you get it from my top awesomearticles.com, you know, <laughs> made by Joey Tribbiani, for whatever reason. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you, you're going to want to click the via link and probably click that via link as well, too. So, mm. But, uh, yeah, I, I, the Washington Post has been around long enough that even people that don't know about the Washington Post has heard about it, so their, their notoriety um, is going to probably keep some sub subscribers on their... Uh, um, on their reading list, if you will. 
Otherwise, yeah. your RSS feed of them is just going to be the first, the, uh, just going to be an excerpt, and it's going to piss a lot of people off. So, <laughs> all right, check this out. I've been digging in the article and found this little caveat. The Washington Business Journal reported last month that the Post has been surveying users about potential uh, about potential options. It quoted one user as saying that the Post had inquired about seven day delivery and unlimited web access for $25 a month. Unlimited web access without a print subscription for $15 a month and Sunday delivery and unlimited web access for $8 a month. Hmm. So eight bucks a month. So the price of Netflix, you get uh, just the, you can get online and watch it. You can get like real newspapers as well as the other thing for $25 a month. I wonder how much a regular magazine subscription is nowadays. I think it's still about like fourteen bucks. I think. Uh, yeah, I agree. Okay, so it's not it's not out of there. so maybe if you really do wa love the Washington Post, whether they're conservative or uh, <laughs> or uh, a little bit more lefty, then um, hmm. I guess this would be a possible option for you. All right, so maybe it's not so archaic as a business model as I keep thinking it is. I don't know. Maybe it is still archaic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how much, how long this lasts and see if they're able to pull it off. Because, you know, Fox kind of screwed up with their daily, and Washington Post has been hanging in there and doing theirs okay. So not Washington Post, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal. So we'll see how this turns out. Yeah. All right. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> All right, let's take a quick break. Take one of our sponsors, which is uh, dine dot com. Now, if you are in the, if you are building a website and you want to have reliability, which is key to a successful website, then you know what dine dot com is a service that you really really should check out. Now, with dine. Uptime is the bottom line. They use a variety of features and a variety of services, like in the ones that they call off are called active failover, load balancing, and global traffic management. They use these services just to make sure that your site stays up when you're using Dyn.com and that no DNS problems that have been that can happen in the world will take down your site for any reason whatsoever. Now they also have other advantages and other packages like they have a variety of packages for people from the beginner level up through enterprise and they have everything even getting your own domain name so they go pretty deep into this entire setup and into the service issue but their biggest deal is most important reliability with their website so we want you to do this here to go ahead and check them out and get 30% off their packages that way so you can get started and save some money at the same time go to dine.com forward slash podcast 30. Once again, that's dine.com forward slash podcast 30. Go to that URL, fill it out, put in lazy tech guys, where you heard from you, where you heard from them and enjoy 30% off their service. And most important of all, enjoy the fact that your website will stay up and it will not go down and it will be there for your customers. So remember uptime is the bottom of the line dine.com. Thank you again for being a sponsor. All right, guys, let's get serious. Enough hanging out, talking, and all that kind of good <laughs> stuff here. Let's get serious here. All right, so who here actually use Google Reader a lot? I oh, Rad. To. There you go, Rad. There you go. Tony, how about you? I used to. Oh, Victor was a huge year too, and we were like e emailing each other over what would happen. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so. hey uh, Andrew, do you ever Google Reader? Can't say they ha have. I bet if Google Reader was on the side of an AK-47, you probably would have checked it out. Maybe. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your six. Anyway, all right, so <laughs> Google Reader is... So Google recently announced that Google Reader, they're, I guess they're ending it in, what, a month or so now is the word? And um, before we really get down into the topic, it looks like they didn't just kill Google Reader, but they also killed the Chrome RSS add-on also. So it looks like they looks like Google is actually at a war with their own RSS feeds <laughs> or their RSS what APIs or something is that what they're So I mean what do you guys think of this one here Rad especially you since you're a big programmer and you you're kind of into this entire thing plus you actually use Google Reader <laughs> So what do you yeah. think of this It's a well a lot of I guess half of the people even at Twit said it was kind of a big deal uh, a couple of my friends use Google Reader also but mostly because of necessity, uh, excuse me, necessity, and um, um, if you guys use other readers on top of it, like Feedly uses, you know, Google Reader as its base, um, 
and there are plenty of other third parties that do this, they're now at a loss for what they could possibly do. So um, if anyone's familiar with RSS feeds, it's really just literally a feed of you know, a big huge file that goes towards you and you're literally, uh, you have like a program that makes it look nice, kind of like Flipboard, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but in this case, this one uses your Google Reader. So if you log in with your Google account, it links to your Google account and your Google Reader and you're literally, um, it's literally pulling stuff from Google Reader to display stuff on a screen. Um, both Vic and I use Feedly, which makes use of Google Reader, and now Feedly is at a fork in the road whether they should just shut down, which is probably not going to be likely, or um, create a whole new database where it's going to keep all of the settings from what it reads from Google Reader and literally um, push everyone on Feedly, which is pretty crazy. Sorry to interject, uh, Rev, but I read somewhere that Feedly had a spike in new accounts because of this announcement. Mm -hmm. So Feedly's looking to kill oh, yeah, the product. I mean, two, yeah, it would be two things, obviously. Like, don't. I mean, one option, of course, is a shutdown, which would never happen. The second option, the only reason why I say the first option, because there's a lot of other third-party guys that right. would be forced to do it because they don't have the capital that Feedly has or they don't have, like, the backing Feedly has. Okay, so, all right. Um, but um, for Feedly, they would literally have to get everyone's information and bring all of the settings that is already on Google Reader and put it on Feedly. So um, I don't know how much of that information would entail, but um, there's like a lot of people, including myself, that ask them, okay, so what, what's going to happen to Feedly? Are you guys going to keep all of our settings here? Because essentially that's really what it is. It's Instead of Google handling all of the feeds, it's it's Feedly. Feedly, yeah. yeah. And it makes all a lot I, of sense. I, I used to use uh, my Google Reader login for mm -hmm. Pulse. And um, it was really nice because every time I, you know, started up a new phone, I wouldn't have to add my feeds every single time. But mm -hmm. uh, one thing I also noticed was when I went to uh, Google Reader's website, all of the articles that I looked at were still counted as unread. So that was kind of, like, weird to me. No, it's I, not so weird because uh, that means the setting is done on their side versus Google's side. Well, it's weird. It, yeah. It's not weird to you as a developer, but for a user... It's yeah. like that doesn't. Oh, yeah. It shouldn't. Yeah. It shouldn't. It should match up. You know what I'm saying? Like it should well, say that's the it's red. Why, this is the reason why I want to explain to users why it's shutting down. So, mm -hmm. um, the reason why Google is shutting down. This is always hard for people to to understand. Like, man, there, there there's thousands and thousands of people. How could they just possibly shut down? Like everyone's using it. Well, you know, to create these data centers, they're like hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to support. Literally in the millions of dollars. And the reason why it doesn't sound like a lot when 2 million or 3 million people use it, it doesn't sound like a lot, right? But then when you have third party, maybe about maybe 100 or even 1,000 third parties hitting Google Reader, fetching data from there, it's literally like 1,000 companies going on top of your back and literally pulling data over and over and over again. So it's like getting traffic and multiplying it by 100,000. Because instead of instead of the company like Feedly doing it, they're depending on Google to do it. So but isn't that what Google wants? No, I thought that Google wants you to stay in their ecosystem so they can continue. They did to until it got expensive. Something. So it's just like, okay. for instance, like um, uh, what's a good example? Like for instance, Apple wanted to do cloud service, but it's just way too expensive. Like to do that, like Google spends tons and tons of money on Google Drive already. So their idea was, like, do we move Google Reader in that direction or do we just let third parties deal with it? Because third parties were having a free ride. They're literally, instead of having their own back end, they're just pointing at Google Reader to do it. Hmm. So how so, come Google it isn't just telling their Google, uh, Google Reader clients to move over to Google Currents? I mean, at least on mobile. Because they're not the same. It, they're totally not the same. Like, can you explain uh, to me why? Cause I, I because I actually don't know. I just assumed that they were pretty much the same. Because Google Currents is actually a news feed of coming from Google search and it's get it's pushed that way to make it look like RSS feeds but it's not and then Google Reader is just literally RSS feeds being parsed but if I have lazy tech guys an RSS feed and Google currents as an R uh, lazy tech guys and Google currents it's gonna pop up at the same thing isn't it yes and no so like um, Google currents uses these alerts right so those alerts are actually coming from Google News um, but I mean, there's some other stuff that's coming up, but the big thing is that with Google Reader, um, it has an open API, and Google Currents does not. 
So Google Reader has an open API that all these other developers jump on top of. So mm -hmm. just think of it as a free data center for everything. Like, uh, just imagine, um, like, um, what's a good example? A good example would be, like, you know, a bridge, and all these cars are driving, are, are driving on it, but instead of, you know, like one bridge and how expensive it is to maintain it, you know, you have, they want to, they want everyone else to kind of create their own bridges and, you know, go through it. So it's, it's probably not the best metaphor, but really it just got expensive for Google. It was so that's, expensive. that's probably why the rumor of Pulse joining in with LinkedIn is closer to being the part of the truth, right? Yeah, it's like, I mean, just imagine like these developers, like they don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to, you know, to create a data center because it's expensive, like, you know, and people are putting their feeds in there, right? Then you have all these thousands of people are like saying, you know what, we could create one like mom and pop guy from the garage, you know, someone from the garage can just write up their own, you know, XML parser and then push at Google Reader. They'll just say, oh, all you need is a Google authentication to get in. They authenticate and all of a sudden Google is the one handling the back. So all you do is do deal with the display. Okay. So Google was like, "Oh, this is cool," but then it got so expensive. He was like, "Well, do we want to do we want to put more money into this hole or not? Because we're not making money out of it." You know, what I mean, they're not. There's no advertising on it. There's no like if you look at the uh, a Google Reader feed, there's no advertising in between for every feed that right. you see. So it's just one feed. So, um, but yeah, um, uh, but I had a question. With Google Currents, yeah, I mean that makes sense. The thing, the difference is that Google Currents doesn't have an API, and um, they advertise on it, at least I think. Okay. I got a question for you. Do you think part of the reason behind this move, I mean, I'm thinking it's two things. Well, kind of is what I was thinking. One, because apps like Pulse are here. Now, Tony, let's go back to Pulse here because I use it also. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've been using Google Currents also. Mm -hmm. The um, I find that with Pulse, when I first started using it, I used Google Reader because it was a great way of getting me to get all the feeds started. It was like a great starting right. block, and I built it from there. Right. But then I started to notice how they started to fix how you started to find everything, and I actually just started getting in them and then started logging things to your own account, meaning that mm -hmm. after you find it all, you just log it to Facebook or you just create an account with them, and right. then now it always follows you. So in a way, right. the one advantage that Google Reader had, which was your feeds following you everywhere, is not really needed anymore because apps right. like Pulse, apps like Currents, and other apps out there are now starting just to remember your information and link it with Facebook. So I'm thinking that might be part of the reason why. And then kind of go why and say, yeah, it costs money to hold the data centers and do this information. Yet, why do we should we even bother when everybody else is doing it off their all these other feeds anyway, and we're not really benefiting from it, and it's costing us money, and they're making money on Currents because it has ads. That's we know it. Sounds. Pretty okay, logical. Yeah, very. I mean, that's a logical explanation for me. Right. Cool. Another thing. All right, second reason. Google's information company, right? They like to get information on people. And they like to exploit it for their evil ways. Oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm joking about that. I, I, they're not. I'm joking. Anyway, um, who's to say that... Um, Part of the reason why they used Google Reader was to gather information about what people like, what their dislikes were, what news topics they found interesting or not. But with services that they own where they're able to get this information, I don't know, sort of like Google+, Plus, that they would probably be wanting to use that as a way of getting people in there. So it's like, and using current. So continue using yeah. current and maybe link that to Google+, Plus or something. I don't know. They yeah. could use services like that. Mm -hmm. and continue to try to gather the information that they were able to get out of Google readers. Like, well, we get the same information over here, and we get better information, so why even bother with this other thing? Mm -hmm. yeah, Sound legit? That's a, that's a good argument, like, for Google+. Plus. Yeah. Well, not really just for Google+, Plus, but just, like, why they don't need Reader, like, why Reader's losing its importance to them. Like, mm -hmm. if, you know, if everybody else has got their own feeds and everybody's using their own deal and they're having to pay money for this crap and they're getting better information from their own services that they, they offer. Hey, Tony, did they announce, like, the, the number of people that actually used Google Reader? Like, I don't believe they made that public. Or okay. maybe they did, but they, it wasn't part of the main announcement. It was just kind of a list of things that they were getting rid of, and that was, like, number two on the list or something. Mm. And that's what people were really focused on. Because... I mean, uh, you you know the numbers. I mean, how many people actually click our links are are that that we are subscribing? For? Yeah, you know it's hard to say because it really depends. Some people can't see it, 
and then there's some people that know how to use it. So um, at least for us, I think there's about only it's less than ten thousand. I could tell you that, <clears throat> but that's only because most of our audience is on um, Twitter and Facebook. Right. Okay. So yeah. All right. We'll get we'll get the rest of you guys. All right. <laughs> now. Other big crazy things happening here is the CEO of EA, John Rigatello. 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 Yeah, uh, Rigatello. <laughs> Sorry, I keep forgetting. If I was like two C's, I was like, is that G or C? <laughs> you know. Uh, sorry, I am not. You know, he steps down. Literally steps down. This comes after a long series of drops. But anyway, um, Andrew, how about you stay, take the lead on this one here? What uh, what's going on here? Yeah, so basically um, today, based off of uh, a couple articles, actually, uh, he basically put out an MMO. Basically, he's resigning from EA. Um, he's basically stepping down as both the CEO and member of the board of directors, and it's going to be effective the 30th of March. Um, apparently, EA is going to be still finding a replacement to fill in his spot, so... Um, the person who's basically taking uh, temporary leadership for EA is going to be Larry Probst. He's, I think there was another one. He's actually um, had a few years prior it, it, with EA as far as, um, I think he was a financial uh, advisor or um, he was part of their financial department. But uh, he's going to be taking a lead until they find a suitable replacement for the CEO spot. So you're saying he knows a little something about money? Yeah, he's been. Uh, I think he's been with uh, EA since '97 as well. He's, awesome. one, of the, he's one of the old school guys. Here's the full letter of resignation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, All it's right. actually below as well. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, there's a lot of reasons behind this. Now, here are the here are the reasons that are being given. Um, one, the the company has not been doing very well since he's taken over. He said apparently two thirds of the value of the company is just gone. Doesn't sound like what you want a CEO to do. Um, they've also apparently have had not very good acquisitions. Like let's think about what EA has done recently that's helped them out. I mean, so they had an awesome launch of SimCity, which I'm sure was the most recent catalyst. <laughs> they've um, <laughs> Let me see, what else did they do recently? They were voted the worst company in America. <laughs> um, they were, I'm trying to remember, they have been under multiple DRM suits, I mean, dairy DRM issues, and most important of all, they bought, they bought like, the company, the Bejewel company who makes that stuff and haven't really done a whole lot, PopCat Games. Okay. Haven't done a lot, a lot with that yet. I don't know, it just seems like they, he, it seems like he's been leading them to try out to do different directions for I mean in the direction with the company I just don't think the direction has been working I mean Rad do you think this is a good move for EA you think this is the right decision for them to oust them or or have him be ousted I don't know well part of it he was actually trying to help because he opened helped open up uh, you know that uh, that private part of EA where a lot of indie developers are trying to jump on it I just don't know if he was able to profit off of it so that's probably why he got kicked out I don't know. I can get a chance to read the whole story, but uh, just based on, like, I've been reading a lot of the analysis, but I haven't read the original story of why he was kicked out. But um, was he kicked out or he, he, he resigned? He stepped he, out. He resigned. Excuse me. He, he just resigned. Yeah, but yeah. this seems like that resignation that is a little bit of nudging. Like they, yeah. they knew. Like he knew his rep. His uh, the writing was on the wall. Yeah, that's that's what I thought was happening. So, um, but. I don't know. It's really hard to say, you know, why he would leave. It's kind of like uh, the same reason why, like, the guy from Best Buy left, or um, who was some of the other like notable resignations that happened. Um, but, but yeah, it was uh, one of those things where I'm not too surprised. Uh, but again, you know, um, EA always is somewhat full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder. <laughs> Uh, when a lot of certain games, like AAA, like titles, are like uh, you know, um, are on the tightrope, you know what I mean? So I don't know. Well, it's well, you have to factor in the AAA games that they've been doing every year have been let's see, Madden this year, Madden previous year, Madden previous year before that, and then Madden previous year before that. We also had NCAA, NCAA before that, NCAA before that, <laughs> NCAA before that. We can do that with FIFA. 
We can do that with Dead Space. We can do that with um, Tiger Woods was good. Yeah, <laughs> but they released. They got so many games. I mean, I'm wondering. Well, yeah, uh, Medal of Honor, and they tried to do that thing every other game with Medal of Honor and um, what was the other one? And Battlefield, where every other game they were trying to get one going out just to try to keep it fresh. Unlike Activision, who just used the same Call of Duty name and switched off studios. I just, mm-hmm. I, did, I don't know. It just seems like. He either he got left behind. Maybe the decisions were the right decisions, but they just weren't executed correctly. Maybe the vision was not quite the right vision, or maybe it's just changing of the times. It's like the the times changed like a rug right under him. It's just like whoa, now I gotta go this way, you know. Mm. I also want to say it's probably that whole microtransactions ordeal too. Um, that whole debacle about them trying to embrace that. Well, they kind of have to. It's like they like this. The company's trying to enha- enha- like embrace microtransactions, especially right. on the mobile front, because it seems mm-hmm. like that's the way of going. Like Tony, Mo- Real Racing Three is the game that you say you've been hooked on lately, and that's a bit, that is an EA game. Complete microtransactions. Oh, very micro. Yeah, very very <laughs> much micro. micro. Mm-hmm. I you makes you wonder like if are it's they making enough points. It makes you wonder, though, are they making enough on that to be worthwhile to them? Like, are they really making enough for the people who are just saying, ah, screw it, I'll just buy the nice car I want? <laughs> I've always wondered about freemium models in the first place. I mean, one of the, um, it's not EA, but one of the most popular games right now on uh, on iOS mobile is, uh, well, iOS is mobile, but on iOS is Clash <laughs> of Clans, and that's a freemium. It's very similar, Rad, it's very similar to uh, Allies vs. Empires. Of but it's it is. but it's by it's by different uh, by different um, uh, developer, but it's got people hooked. I mean, we were watching the UFC fight, and I had five people watching the fight, and then six people staring at their phones playing this darn game. But it's free, and it's the same thing with uh, Real Racing Three. I haven't spent a dime on it, but you know, I've got one sick Evo and another couple of awesome cars, and you know, <laughs> it, it just all through racing after race after race. My eyes are killing me, but yeah, I, the. Um, I mean, the freemium model must work because it's it's been around for – it's still new. You know, if you think of the whole gaming um, infrastructure, it's still new. But it, it seems like people that want to get into something, um, it gives them the gateway to, without any cost. And then if they really feel that they want to improve their their gaming experience or at least speed it up, that's usually what the cost is, speeding yeah, something yeah. up. Um, they'll do it, you know. Pay for impatience. Maybe, yeah, maybe enough people are, are willing to do it. Because uh, right now I have to buy this BMW, but I, I don't have enough money for it unless I quote unquote buy the the coins for it, you know. Or not, you earn it. Not, not fifty thousand worth, but you know. You, you, you got to earn it. Can you earn it at least? Yeah, I just have to keep on racing, and I yeah. can't. You know, it's the, the 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 race that I can earn the most amount of money on. I I keep coming in first or second place, and it's getting kind of boring. So maybe that's the other hook. It's like, are you bored yet? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just so, just so you know, I did that in the first Gran Turismo a lot too. It was like, you know what? I need a better car. I'm just going to race the race I want to win over and over again until I can make enough money the easy way. Yeah, so it's like the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just I'm curious about whether this... Like, I get the move. I'm, I wanna, I'm curious about the future of EA. I honestly never felt the guy made a bad deci- made too many bad decisions, but I definitely think that a lot of them were kind of maybe not entirely executed correctly, or maybe not doing right. And then plus the DRM thing just never works out in anyone's favor, so that never helps. And the and the Sim City thing was like the ultimate like they sold one point yes. one million in two week copies of that game. Imagine if the Suck. DRM issues weren't there. God. They probably could have sold like two. I mean, one point five million or two million. You know. But so wait, so Sean, like the DRM issues. Was it DRM issue or is it because of the server loading? It's a ser- It's to be. It's a server loading thing, and people calling it a DRM issue because they. It turns out after all this is said and done that the the data isn't hitting the servers the way that we thought they were getting hurt hit. It's not that they're overloading the servers. It's just that there's some there's an error somewhere in the system. You're Something total- doesn't work. And it's, but it's not the overload getting hit in my service. It's something else. And so it goes back to it, DRM right? again. All these developers, we were having a huge debate over like why they were crashing. It was like no one really tested it. it was, uh, I mean, when you have that many people and you're testing SimCity, it's basically supposed to be um, all those cities were supposed to be running persistent side by side, right? Mm-hmm. That's 
That's sort of how it is. Mm -hmm. Imagine like a million cities, literally a million cities in the same world, running at the same time. That's insane. I mean, you think about it, right? So that that was the idea that you could have all these like actual cities real time, right? Like yeah, yeah running yeah. at the same time. Pretty much. So that's, that's, so that's one city. To, that's yeah, why you got to be online at all times. Well, that's the funny thing about it. It's like it doesn't make very yeah. much sense. Like they disabled, okay. they made, they made it now so that they dis they're disabling features remotely. And I'm thinking like they disable like cheetah mode, which is the super fast mode that we all would use in that game. So you know, when you do a couple moves and you put in cheetah mode, it it goes through a couple days. You collect some money, you slow it down, then you go back to work. Well, they disabled that mode remote. Re they disabled that mode remotely. And then, so from a distance, I'm thinking, okay, so they got some kind of link to it in the server. And then there's been a couple hackers out there who've already, within a day or two, have already um, hacked it and made a single player mode. So they just said, oh, boom, 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 done. Now it doesn't connect to that server, and it doesn't do that stuff anymore. Disable the DRM, game runs fine. Hmm. So it's just one of those things. Yeah, that's right. The Mass Effect 3 stuff happened earlier this year. I mean, it's been, it's, it seems like some of the stuff is just bad watch, bad watch, but at the same time, you know, well, we'll see. Hopefully the company does well and they pick it up and just don't drink. Maybe bring us new IPs. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe if you give us something new, people might try something out. Maybe if you didn't maybe. sell the same football maybe game just... every year. Maybe if you could get a basketball game released in the last four years. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Ooh. Sorry, but it's just what it is. And watch mm -hmm. next week. We're gonna have this conversation. Guess what? We're gonna, he <laughs> wrote. He left to go work for Microsoft. Anyway, all right. So let's take a break here, guys. Now, if you're listening to the show, I'm gonna offer you something for you. I'm gonna offer you 30 days to check out Audible.com. It is a quite a killer service that, with it, gives you 30 days. I mean, with it, gives you discounts on audiobooks as well as giving you. A free audiobook in the deal. So you go to this. We want you to go to this URL here. I'm going to give it to you right now, just because I don't want to waste any time. I want you to immediately go right to this www.audibletrial.com forward slash lazy. That's audibletrial.com forward slash lazy. You're going to go there, you sign up for their service. You'll get 30 days on their their other service, and they have over a hundred thousand books to choose from, and you get to get one for free. So you just go shopping, start shopping, start saving money, start getting all this stuff, and then start saving it on your all your phones, your Windows phone, your iOS phone, your Android phone, tablet, whatever. It doesn't matter. It works for everything. Audibletrial.com forward slash lazy. Go to that URL, get your free book, get discounts on other books, and enjoy a quite an awesome service. So, thank you, Audible, for being a sponsor. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Tony, Andy Rubin Lee's Android. Did anyone shed a tear? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it was kind of weird. I was wake, waking up to this, but uh, anyway. for those who for those yeah. who don't know, yeah, Andy Rubin, uh, f uh, originally from Danger Inc., who made the infamous uh, sidekick on T-Mobile with uh, with, a, with a pretty cool team over there. Anyways, like he he's the one that created Android and and actually introduced Android to the Google CEOs back in uh, 2004, like way before we had not way before, but before the iPhone was even a, a, a thought in our minds. Um, I mean, since then, you know, Android was a shot in the dark, and now it is the giant that it is today. And so it's kind of strange to see uh, 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 Mr. Rubin, who is right now Google's uh, senior VP of mobile, leave, not Google, but just leave the position. So I mean, who's going to take the new position, or the position is going to be... Um, the person who's in charge of Chrome, uh, which is uh, Sundar uh, uh, Pikahai. Pick, that's how you pronounce your name. I'm sorry if I'm butchering it. But, uh, yeah, Sundar is actually um, best known for his work with Chrome, and he's actually going to continue uh, doing the dabbling in Chrome while he uh, manages uh, the uh, the mobile section of Google. So... It's going to be interesting because Chrome, uh, Rad, maybe you can uh, shed some light between development between Chrome and uh, and Android, but if I'm not mistaken, they're kind of two different monsters. Yeah, they are. I, I still don't know where they stand in terms of, you know, what apps people are going to build for, but um, it's, it's at first I thought Chrome was going to be like, you know, a lower-end, e easy entry 
thing for uh, developers, you know. But now it just seems like they're um, uh, they're trying to go for the high end stuff too. They're more like like a a sandbox for developers. So, but and then on Android, I. It's like uh, it, it's weird. I almost feel like uh, Android is also trying to cover that part because the, it's such a flexible operating system that it it covers pretty much what you know Chrome covers, but is more app centric versus something that's more desktop. Yeah, Does that make sense? we've seen Android attempt to be a desktop kind of thing, you know, yeah. and we we've kind of cringed at the idea, at least on the design side of it. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't really know if future future designs are going to make it any better. I guess that's why Google attempted to make Chrome OS, you know, and was the low end low end uh, OS for people who don't want to pay for Windows or Mac or something. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, developing for developing your Chrome extensions and, and things of that nature is that JavaScript, HTML five, like what is that? The like what are you what are you actually developing? Uh, like you mean those for apps? Chrome? Yeah. Yeah, actually, exactly that. Chrome HTML5, JavaScript, so, um, and CSS. So all that stuff. I mean, you're you're literally building for the browser, right? And you know, you're creating interactive apps on it, which is sort of bizarre because it's essentially the same thing what you're doing in mobile, you know, except more web-based. And you know, there's web apps for the mobile side. So it's I'm still confused over like what it is. Like a lot of developers. I thinking about. It. I had a discussion with Gina Trapani one time, and she's like an Android developer through and through. And she's like, I don't yeah. know what Chrome OS is for. And she's like, <laughs> I don't know what's that. I mean, I don't know what it's really for. You know, I mean, I know I could just build a web page and it'll show up on, on your browser. <laughs> I was talking. To, yeah, I was talking to her about that uh, sometime too on on Twitter. Like, wait, so is is this relevant? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> like <laughs> right. when the when the Chromebook Pixel came out, I'm like. Well, so this is like thirteen hundred dollars. What am I? What am I paying exactly. for? Exactly. That's what confused me. Yeah. <laughs> You're paying but for it, hardware, baby. Hardware. That's true. That's another. That's and the, the other diamond argument. lining. Yeah. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh, there were people that were installing Linux on the um, the Chromebook Pixel. Um, but so yeah, thirteen hundred dollar Linux box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they were putting. They, they even tried. It's an x86 based machine, right? So um, I haven't seen them try. Installing Win 8 on it, but I mean, looking at it though, the the laptop is impressive looking, at least display wise. So it's a little yeah. boxy, but yeah, it's nice. Yeah, you're right. I'm, uh, I'm a boxy. yeah, but I, I'm still. I wouldn't say. I'm, I don't know. I'm a little concerned with what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but at the same time, I I, I know that Ruben isn't the end all be all person for for Android. Like he has, he's not the one that comes up with all these. Hey, let's do this update. You know, it's this. It's the team behind him, and it's a, it's the team that makes the man, right? I mean, isn't that mm-hmm. some sort of saying along that line? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, it, no it might be team. The, exactly. <laughs> um, unless with, I think there was one. No, but if yeah. you um, there is a me and team. Yeah, there's, there's no me. That's team. it. <laughs> now, if you do a capital A, the little thing at the bottom, <laughs> nice. and the, there's the I. All right. No, but okay. the the um no, but I'm serious. The the uh, the, the um, I, I don't know where Ruben's going. That's that's well, the other thing. Like they haven't really mentioned where he's headed. Why do you have think they? he left? Well, okay. Well, I think that's the speculation. Like, there's a lot of speculation of why he left. Like, was he tired? Was he this? Was he that? <laughs> but you know what? All of this right now is a lot of speculation. But guys, I want to I want to have some fun with this here. Okay, I want to have some a little fun with this. Now, what if there's three guys? There's four of us here. What if you were at Google, you started in it, you were running Android, and you now had the opportunity to leave and go to any division within within Google? Because of course he is staying within Google. So, right. what would you? What division would you go to Google if you have X-Labs. any opportunity? Where would you go to, Tony? Google X Labs. Google X Labs. That, if that's well, a division, that's where I want to go. What that's, would you want to work on? The elevator that goes to the moon. <laughs> nice. Wasn't that a rumor that that's yes. what they're working on? Okay, boom. Yeah. That's right. my project. Rad. What about you, man? Powered by CSS. Um, <laughs> 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 I think he's trying all the. I think he's trying all of the. Um, Not what he's trying. What you want to do, dude? You. What? What I do? 
What would you do if you were Andy Rubin and you had this opportunity? What would you do? I wouldn't leave. <laughs> no, no, you're, but he's sticking with Google. Like he's staying he's with Google. Google. He's, I mean, I wouldn't he's picking, leave He has any object to work on. He can pick. He can have. I would any go time. to. I would go to the Chrome OS division and close it. Really? <laughs> 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 all right, there we go. Like, there you can have move it, over folks. here. Everyone, you're all fired. <laughs> Ruben Andrew, closes you, Chrome dude? OS. <laughs> dun, Andrew, dun, dun. Well, just to kind yeah, of play please. fair, I'd probably go as far as my weight would carry me. Probably somewhere. Up. Okay, within Google, what would you work on? You know, I'm not yeah. really sure. Well, let's see. You know, honestly, I'm you've, not sure. You've got YouTube. <laughs> side. You've got YouTube. You've got Motorola, right? You got yeah, Motorola. You could even go look at Motorola. You could make phones. Yeah, I'd probably work on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just <laughs> the gaming video section of YouTube. You just YouTube. have a bunch of shows. <laughs> you just yes. gonna stay on so Machino's channel all day. See me spinning yes. my chair. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Oh man! All right, so um, I don't know. I, I was thinking about this myself, and I'm like, some people say you can go glass, you could go chrome, you could, you know, do a lot of different options. I was thinking Google X Labs probably work on something in electronics, like sonically. Probably find a way of f finding ways of using sound to move objects, to, so you can remove gravity from objects. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, because I ever read, overheard in an old conspiracy theory that the what they used to move heavy rocks was sound and vibrations. So if you could technically find a way of moving stuff via sound, why not send this guy in there, see if you can make it happen? Yeah, aren't okay. there weapons of sound of mass yeah. destruction? Yeah, yeah so they have, I, I they have weapons that. for it. But what, do we have things that can lift rocks yet? Not oh. yet. But what if you? What well, if we they can move it though, right? Yeah. What if we? So yeah. if they can get the sound to go this way, oh, upwards, <laughs> it, would be, it would be like an it would be like an up and slightly to the left. So, they, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just kind of. I I would love to sit a two ten brick just go, just have it flip all over the place. <laughs> It'd be like like a die. So I don't know. I think I'd probably go into that field, but I definitely would go Google X like Tony. So Tony and I'd be hanging out in Google X while Rad is busy being a dictator and closing place things down. <laughs> Elevators <laughs> to the sky, my friend. Elevators uh, to the sky. Awesome. All right. So one of the one of us had a very very a very very lucky chance to go to an awesome place called Engadget Expand. So. Who was that? No, Tony, tell us about your experience there, man. What's going on? Yes, it was, actually, it was actually pretty cool. Um, and I, I was, I was when Rad brought it to our attention. I was like, it's it's weird going to another press, uh, presses event event, um, a, a press company's event. But at the same time, we go to TechCrunch and Venture Beats event. So I guess I, then I threw that idea out the window. Um, for those who don't know, it was uh, over the weekend, the past two days, uh, Saturday, Sunday, at the beautiful uh, Fort Mason Center at the uh, Festival uh, Pavilion where they have uh, Academy of Friends each year for the, um, for the Oscars. And they took up the whole thing as, as well as another uh, part of the parking space so you could test drive the Tesla S model um, during certain yeah. times of the day, which unfortunately I couldn't do because uh, I had to get back home. But... Um, I got to sit in it, and it was gorgeous, the same gorgeousness that it was at CES. Um, <laughs> there were a number of uh, exhibitors as well as speakers. Of, so uh, it was kind of like a miniature CES at the same time it wasn't because um, they weren't really announcing anything new, but it really did put um, – it, it put names to faces and faces to the technology behind uh, – the faces to the people behind the technology – of the things that we use every single day or the things that we could possibly use. And uh, so, for example, uh, one of the co-founders of Kickstarter uh, was on stage talking about crowdfunding. Um, the CEO of Ouya was also there, which, again, I missed, unfortunately, because I would have dogged her. Um, you would have what? Dogged her, like yelled at her. What, like, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. Just to what, start stuff. Why? You want to be like everybody else? Yeah, just to start stuff and then walk out. Like, you suck, and then walk out. Like, yeah, what just, that guy said. <laughs> just so you no, know, but, the minute you said she was there, I immediately went to the news and started looking for any press on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think um, she learned her lesson at uh, South by Southwest, and whatever they talked about, she tried to keep it on the DL because there, there wasn't really anything – um, in regards to an announcement or newsworthy that came out of her came out of her face, 
But um, <laughs> yeah, there, there were a number. Of <laughs> <laughs> it could just be the mouth, but the whole face. <laughs> there were there were a number of noteworthy um, no- noteworthy exhibitors there. What'd you say and from I- your ear? What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, w- one of the companies that I got to take a look at was called well, their techno their their uh, product was called Player. And I don't believe that's the name of the company itself. But anyways, Player uh, is is a little HDMI plug-in <laughs> device that allows you to stream your media content directly either from your phone, um, tablet, or computer over DLNA. And so similar to it would be like a an Apple TV. This is a little bit cheaper, but also you can you can actually control multiple TVs simultaneously from your device as long as the player is plugged into them. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, Oh, what happened to my video? Oh, I didn't have a video. Oh yeah, I did. Um, no, it's if you go to lazytechguys.com, it's actually uh, it's actually a pretty uh, pretty cool article. Um, at least I think so. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, it's 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 this really simple solution for you to get your content um, from from your phone. Uh, like if you're trying to share a slideshow at a party. And you and you know, thirteen people are trying to look at the same slideshow on your iPhone. It's like, well, let me just plug in my player. And as long as there's an open Wi-Fi, that's kind of the caveat there. You, it's DLNA, so it has to be over Wi-Fi. But then you can connect to the TV and you know, show it off on the TV. Um, and then also, Player itself has uh, curated content, so you can watch shows from their own like Revision Three channels and like History Channel stuff, like things that are free that you could go to HistoryChannel.com to look over. But they have it already in channels uh, made made out for you. The the second thing is Securify. We actually saw them at CES a year ago, and then this past year, and then now we see them again uh, with the Almond Plus. And it's it's an upgraded version of their original Almond. Uh, the Almond uh, was the was the world's first uh, Wi-Fi router with the touchscreen, and the Almond Plus is pretty much the same thing. But they have a gigabit um, Wi-Fi connection, so it's very very fast. It's much faster, and then also it's the first. Uh, Wi-Fi router that also is mountable. You can actually mount it onto your wall if you wanted to. And then also it has home automation capabilities. So um, if you look at the picture um, that is on my screen here, you see those little white bars. Those are those bars that you that you screw into your door. So when you open up your door, your window, um, it is, it's a sensor and it tells you if your door is open or not and so this can connect over Wi-Fi so you can kinda of control all those you can turn lights off and on um, so yeah it's it's actually um, a, a really cool product that we I hope to be able to review um, in, in the next uh, month or so but it was also a successful Kickstarter project too which should also be noted that uh, people were really looking for um, that all-in-one kind of uh, solution for your your home automation. Now, personally, I think if you want to control your home automation stuff, you'd want to do it from your phone or your tablet. But I guess there are enough people that don't mind doing it from their Wi-Fi router uh, that's hanging on the wall and that they're happy. Um, hey, real quick, yeah. so I'm looking at this here, this technology of what they've done here, and I like what they've done. But to me, it still seems like it's the beginning, the forefront of future home automations when they really start building that technology in the houses. This is like this is like retrofitting your car with the new upgraded brakes so they can start being modern. It just seems like this is the same thing for your house, right? Yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's definitely the first step, if that's what you're awesome. saying. Yeah, yeah, it just it, it just I can't wait till the I just can't wait till what, twenty years from now when we start seeing houses with this built in and they don't they all these sensors will, won't have to be added to the outside of the door, but they'll be in the doors and all the lights will automatically be ready to go. Oh, it's gonna well, be Well, so I mean fun. if you think about, you know, um, our other editor, he he moved into a house that has the Ethernet cables already in the walls, you know? Like we don't we uh, Rad, I think you also have that that uh, that luxury. But we that live in houses from the nineteen hundred. We have to do it ourselves, or we, <laughs> or we have to go Wi-Fi. Which I'm using Wi-Fi right now, and it's really shoddy. So I'm like, I I'm thinking about actually going in and actually drilling the holes. But yeah, I mean, later down the line, the, all this home automation stuff that you could find um, in mansions and newer houses, like newer townhouses and things like that. That that's gonna be. That's just gonna be something that just comes. With the houses, like you know, back wait. in the like you know, back in the day, we were like, "Does this phone have Bluetooth?" Oh, yes, it does. Well, then I want now every phone has Bluetooth. If your phone doesn't have Bluetooth, it's not a phone. 
<laughs> Thank you. What do you if got it there, man? Have apps, it's not a phone. Yeah. I mean, wait, wait, wait. That's, not, that's not a phone. That's not a phone. Man, what kind of phone is that? Anyway. But yeah, I mean, a- Andrew. Antenna. Andrew's very. Andrew is very true. It's very. Uh, it, this kind of thing is very Hal nine thousand uh, a space odyssey. If you don't get the reference, go look it up. But it's um. But it doesn't talk to you, which is good. Oh. It's, yeah. It can be annoying. You know, my my alarm system already talks to me. Front door open. Shut up. Just be glad I it's not personalized it. too. Tony, your <laughs> right. door's open. Please I lock know. it. <laughs> um, the next thing that I got to take a look at was a company that has three projects on on uh, Indigo, actually uh, Indigo, Indiegogo, and uh, it's, the company's <laughs> called Stick and Find, and um, wow. their and um, their first product, Stick and Find, they're Bluetooth stickers that have a range of 150 uh, feet, and you can stick it onto your keys, your pets, uh, even you know, your shoe, and up until 150 feet, uh, you will be able to uh, track whatever it is that you want to track using your iPhone. Um, we've seen in the past a couple of these uh, trackers, but they've been kind of big and bulky. Like I reviewed the hip key, which allows you to track the mo- um, the movement and the uh, the area of your uh, of your luggage, but it's this big kind of crescent thing. And this is about the size of a quarter. So it's very uh, low battery power, and uh, it's a, it was a very successful product on uh, Indiegogo. Uh, the second thing that they uh, came out with was the Bluetooth tracker, which is essentially the same thing, but at 2,500 feet. And it also has a GPS uh, engine in it, too. So uh, if you're out on a uh, Chrissy Field or you know a big place that is you know over 2,000 feet long and you're trying to find your dog or you're trying to find something or you're just trying to find your way back to your golf cart and you happen to tack this on, you can you know literally use GPS to find it. Um, and then lastly, which I thought was one of the coolest things um, from this company, is called the meter plug. Now it looks like a regular wall plug that you just plug in, you know, your electronics, but it actually has a companion application that says that uh, basically spits out reports every week, every day, or whatever, uh, telling you whatever's plugged into this plug, um, it'll let you know how much electricity is being used up. Um, in dollar amounts. So I want to say oh, you've used this amount of gigawatts. Like, I don't even know what that is. But you've used $13 this week. Like, whoa. 1.21 of it. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so the, the other cool thing about it, too, is um, it, as long as you're in a 100-foot range of it, uh, because it is over Bluetooth, again, it's... Um, then you're going back in time to if that's what you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. <laughs> But if you're in a 100-foot range of it, you can actually uh, switch off whatever plugged in. So as you guys know, your TV right now, it's turned off, but it's not off. It's still draining standby. power. Yeah. Right, it's on standby. Yeah. So this would actually what? allow you to... Say the light to me. Shenanigans. <laughs> this would actually allow you to turn it all the way off, which if you have a, you know DVR and all this other stuff, it's going to screw everything up. But you know if you don't, then this might be a nice kind of uh, way to uh, save, save, some, uh, save some money. And... Um, Again, this was another successful project on uh, Indiegogo. And so all this stuff you can find out on LazyTechGuys.com. The last thing I want to mention is this really cool product for the iPhone 4 and 4S and 5 called the Scubo. Scubo? Yeah, Scooby-Doo. Um, <laughs> it's essentially this uh, really cool uh, case that it's, it's a combination of a case, uh, application, and accessory. So uh, you can actually take 3D photographs and video with the, with the Scubo. And what it is is um, the it uses your existing iPhone camera, but with the application itself. It, it makes it into like a stereoscopic 3D image. And then you have what's called the Scubo viewer that slides on top of the screen of your iPhone to project it what? essentially into 3D. So if you guys think of the technology that they use on the 3DS, yeah. it's the same idea. So wow. you have to look directly at it. But Scuba's gotten so much uh, publicity, at least in Europe, because they're out of Spain, that they're, they've signed a deal with Disney. So if you go to the website, you can actually see some of their, their concept art uh, with uh, Darth Vader, uh, the Hulk uh, from the Avengers, so a bunch of like Disney-related cases because you know you want to protect your phone. Um, but that—that's how you take the 
the picture. If you want to do video, you can do one minute videos with this little Scubo plugin, which will plug into the uh, the Lightning dock or the, uh, the the regular 30 pin plug for the iPhone 4, and take high definition video. And then you have all this 3D content. You know, what do you do with it? Well, then you can share it with other Scubo users. Scubo has created their own kind of social network for you to show off other Scubo you know, videos and pictures. And then also, if you have a 3D TV, you can shoot your Scubo stuff over to your 3D TV. Um, uh, again, I, I, they said either using DLNA or um, or uh, or your Apple TV. So, yeah, uh, we actually got a review unit. And um, as I don't have an iPhone, I'm waiting for somebody, somebody's roommate to pick up his phone and let me know when I can borrow his iPhone and, uh, and review it. So, yeah, I'm excited because it, it's... Uh, it's you have a um, 4S one? No, it's a 5. Just a five so yeah. it, does Just it not work with any iPads or in the iPod? Excuse me. No, because, yeah, I mean... It has to be perfectly I, fitted. I, I guess that you could... Feasibly download it for an iPod if if it um, if it lets you download it for the iPod and then you would you can put the screen over the iPod if you really really want to try it. But I'm I'm trying to review the whole package like to see how the case is you know yeah, see if yeah. it's flush. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Also, also what should yeah. be noted. Yeah. Yeah, 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 When you're not using the viewer, you can actually you can actually slide the viewer out and put it behind the iPhone. So. Um, at, at your beck and call, you can slide the viewer and put it in on, on, in the front screen or or take it out. So you're not just here's my phone, here's my viewer. What the heck do I do with my viewer? You you, you have a place for it. Um, there, there, Microsoft was there. Lenovo was there. We got a couple of reviews coming in from them. Um, Asus was there. Nest was there. We're gonna be reviewing the Nest, uh, which is that thermostat thing. Um, and then something that was pretty cool, there was, um, I'm not exactly sure what the product itself was, but um, it was a more of a medical field where this lady came in and she was paralyzed, I believe, from the waist down. She couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair. And then she got into this kind of mech warrior contraption and she got in <laughs> and she started walking. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, All yeah, right. I, I, I got a video of it and it was like, whoa, what the heck? And, you know, it, uh, it wasn't like, you know, Riley from... Aliens or anything like that? Not right? yet, not yet. But it was, you Ripley. know, Ripley. Ripley. Thank you. But it's, it's, it's. Uh, it was, uh, it was really cool to see something like that in real life because you know you've seen it on YouTube once in a while. It's like, but to see it in real life, it's kind of heartwarming, you know. Um, and then they also had um, these really big kind of machines where you can do like uh, micro surgery on something. Like you could peel, peel the skin off of a grape with these huge machines and these very fine. Fine uh, tooth kind of material, um, uh, tools and stuff, and you're you're doing it all through like virtual reality kind of thing. It's not it's it's just insane. It was uh, it was. It was they had that machine there at Expand. Yeah, it, it was by a company called Da Vinci. So look it up. Just go to Expand Da Vinci. I couldn't even try it out. The line was like you know, like huge, but even when I flashed my press pass, I'm like press. They're like yeah, the line's there. Like oh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, if you guys have a chance, uh, you know, readers, listeners, whoever, if you guys have a chance to go to uh, Engadget Expand next year, it's family friendly. It's nice because it's it's over the weekend. Um, <laughs> it's robot it's, friendly too. Apparently, yeah. I mean, it's you have to pay for it. It's not free. Um, but with it, you get you get a chance to kind of see what we do. Uh, you get a chance to see some upcoming project uh, products um, that, or project products that you um, might not know about that. You, you think is really really awesome. Um, also, there's free food, you know, fairly decent food. You know, cookies, Coke, and you know, the coffee and, and sandwiches. Make a sandwich. And um, and throughout the whole day, there's fireside chats and other uh, you know debates and uh, and other things going on in the big the big room like they normally do at these types of events. So if you want to you know stick your head in there and and see what these Tech moguls and tech analysts have to say about their company or what what they think that is going to happen in the future. Then this is a pretty cool uh, place to do it. So, in Gadget Expand 2014, we'll see you guys there. Awesome, thank you very much, Tony. I'm happy you got a chance to go there, have some fun, and you know, meet Da Vinci, da Vinci themselves. 
I mean, oh, I'm sorry, I was a robot. My bad, sorry. <laughs> the, <laughs> anyway, I'm just being a little silly. But, you know, it was a fun show. Thank you, every, all you three you guys, for hanging out with me. And most important of all, thank you, all you listeners out there, for um, checking us out and listening to us. So let me give you some contact information for us. Comments at LazyTechGuys.com is the email. You can actually give us a call at area code 707 we are on the social networks, Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Plus. If you look up Lazy Tech Guys, and our YouTube cha- YouTube channel is Lazy Tech TV. That's the one you want to look for, and that's the one you want to use when you're trying to find us. Now, one last thing here. Um, we also started another show here. It's actually called LTG Radio. It's actually a show that's gonna, that is uh, helpful for independent artists and a way of getting some music exposed for independent, up-and-coming, and... Um, Really, just great songwriters. We have great material out there. So, if you're interested in it, we have a whole podcast out there. Please check it out. We have it's a new show. We also have a Wireless Weekly, which we do film. I'm sorry, we do record and film on Tuesdays, and we also have the Lord to Gaming, which will be back this week. Andrew, which will be back this week, and um, that will be we record on Thursday. So, I just want to go ahead and hip you to the new shows that we have going on, and that you definitely should come down to and check us out here. But now, we are done. We have officially gone through our topics. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back next week, and we are out. See you later.